My name is John O'Sullivan. I'm the director of the Danube Institute. Um, we're a small think tank. We have been in existence now for less than a year. We were actually launched on the 25th of February. Um, our political position, so to speak, is clear. We are uh, classical liberals, uh, free marketeers in economics, conservatives in culture, and Atlanticists in foreign policy. But we're also great believers in debate, so um, we want to start and continue debates between, on the one hand, classical liberals and conservatives, secondly, between both classical liberals and conservatives and their democratic opponents. And um, uh, we believe that in Central Europe there has been too much partisanship and not enough debate. And we think that debate is a good way of actually bringing um, the levels of partisanship down because people, after all, in debates have to listen to each other if they're going to be able to answer what the other person has said. And that's our, our basic position. But uh, today we're uh, choosing a subject um, and we have a distinguished uh, a group of uh, three panelists, which we think will be four by the end of the afternoon because the fourth panelist is at the moment on a flight from London um, having, uh, his, having not got the, an earlier plane. Um, um, and we have a very distinguished uh, uh, panel, both with and without the fourth speaker. Uh, the topic is, is the West losing the information war? Um, and if so, does it really matter? Yesterday and the day before, I was in Vilnius, whereas I was at a conference organized by two local think tanks uh, and bringing together a group of Russian intellectuals, Baltic intellectuals, Swedish and uh, Polish intellectuals, and a few handful of people from London and other, other places. The, uh, the topic was actually not the topic we're discussing today. It was a wider discussion of the Ukraine crisis in all its aspects. But it very quickly became a discussion uh, about the, um, the, the information war, the way in which uh, the uh, crisis in Ukraine was perceived in Moscow, how it was perceived differently in, in Western Europe, in Central Europe, and in the United States, and why this was. What were the reasons for this? And one of the reasons that was put forward by speakers across the spectrum, really, was that there is now, in, in, uh, from Russia and in Russia, um, a much more powerful propaganda machine, and a more effective one, and a more sophisticated one, than, has been, uh, than had been the case for a very long time. Um, the, the main face of this machine is that of Russia today. And of course, anyone from Russia today, if anyone from Russia today is here, would deny, of course, that, um, and, and I think uh, would deny that it is either in itself or part of a propaganda machine. And I believe the editor in chief has sometimes threatened to sue people um, who've described it that way. But anyway, um, there is no doubt that from the um, perspective of a lot of people uh, who followed these things, it is indeed part of a much bigger, well, let us call it aspect of Russian public diplomacy, which is playing a part in how we see these crises. Now, um, on the Western side, there has been, first of all, uh, a, a, a very se severe set of cutbacks in public expenditure on public diplomacy of one kind or another. Um, we've seen the some of the. Not only have the, has the BBC had to cut the Russian service, or has cut the Russian service, but also um, the expenditure by the U.S. Congress on the. Uh, Voice of America and the so-called surrogate broadcasters, which of course the most famous and largest is Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Um, the spending on those collectively has gone down to about $700 million a year. That is less, <coughs> less than um, half of what Russia spends on its uh, public diplomacy uh, and propaganda outlets. And what is true for Russia is true for other countries as well. Iran and Turkey and other countries also have upped their, um, and China, have also s strongly increased their expenditure uh, on, on this. And very interesting to me that when I came to live in Budapest uh, about a year ago, that television in my um, uh, hotel had Chinese, Japanese, um, uh, BBC, uh, but not the English language service, the, the Iranian service. <laughs> that was because the hotel turned out to be owned by an Iranian. Um, um, 
oh, I, I could go on. There were about seven or, oh yes, Al Jazeera. And there were seven or eight uh, major channels. And I have to say that uh, it, watching them all, um, since there were no entertainment channels to amuse me, watching them all over a period of time was a genuine public education. It was a genuine education because, for example, I was much more impressed than I expected to be by, for example, the editorial standards of Al Jazeera in the English language. Um, I can make criticisms of it, but they certainly wouldn't have been the criticisms I would have perhaps made five or six years ago. Um, it was Its coverage of some of the events in the Middle East was extremely good. Uh, maybe my panelists will differ what I've said just now, we'll see. But nonetheless, to, to watch um, the same event reported from these different angles and perspectives was extremely useful and, um, and, and revealing, of course, and also alerts one to one's own bias. So I don't want, so we, we're, we're not going to have here today some kind of one-sided uh, view of things. We will, we will, I think, as we explore it, find ourselves uh, discovering um, aspects of these different um, cultural approaches to, to news and current affairs um, extremely revealing to, to you and to us. Well, having said that, let me now um, say introduce our three speakers. I'll do so very briefly because in the course uh, of, the, um, of the presentations, I think they're going to be telling us about some of the things they have done in, in journalism. But um, I'm going to begin, uh, just have three brief introductions, and then I will ask the, the third uh, um, person to, to open the, the debate. Um, Elizabeth Robson is formerly with the BBC. She started the Ukrainian service, and uh, she has um, uh, been in charge of the Russian uh, service. I'm, I'm, uh, there are many other things one could say about her, but she is an experienced broadcaster with a very sharp editorial eye. And I look forward to what she has to say, which will be really much more about what happened in the Cold War than, than, than what's happened now. But that, of course, where it has relevance to what's, what's happening today to uh, Ian Elliott, um, who in addition to being uh, her husband, is also a <laughs> former uh, distinguished um, uh, correspondent and head of um, Radio um, Liberty uh, in, in, the, in the Munich days, I think. Um, and Peter Pomeranzev. And Peter Pomeranzev is, the, this is really a family affair today, Peter Pomeranzev is the son of the fourth panelist who will be here later, <laughs> uh, Igor Pomeranzev, who is an extremely distinguished broadcaster in both the BBC in the past and today in the Russian service of Radio Liberty. Um, and I should say, regularly comes out as in opinion polls, so to speak, marketing surveys as one of the most popular broadcasters. Um, and we hope he arrives in time. Uh, now, let me turn to Peter. Peter Pomeranzev is a documentary producer and a journalist. He has established himself first in, in documentary in Moscow um, and then subsequently coming, r returning to London where he grew up. Um, he has become a major uh, commentator. He is the author of, uh, excuse me, the author of this uh, Institute of Modern Russia publication, Russia, a Postmodern Dictatorship. Um, but he's also to be found in venues as various as um, the Daily Beast magazine, Internet magazine, and the London Review of Books, and finally Newsweek. So I'd like on your behalf to welcome all three speakers, and I hope in due course all four. But having said that, let me now turn to Peter and ask him to kick off the discussion. So shall I use this microphone? Yeah. <coughs> So should I, should, I, I, is there translation going through earphones, or were, were um, the well, working, I, this is a conductive working language? language. Yeah. Great. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, so just to tell you a bit about myself, I spent nine years living in Moscow, um, where obviously my uh, my roots are, working in inside Russian television, um, and I've just I was just finishing a book about my experience uh, of this slightly surreal world. Um, and as I was doing that, I had to sit down and, and watch quite a lot of Russia Today. I mean, I'd worked in a very different part of, of Russian television, but I, Russia Today was slowly developing uh, as I was in Russia, and I had to sit down and watch it as part of my analysis. This was before Ukraine. Um, I had a chapter in my, in my book about it. And, um, and uh, has anybody here sat down to watch a whole day of, of Russia Today ever? This, uh, no? Oh, you're missing out. Um, so, so, so it's, it's a surreal kaleidoscope. Um, 
uh, of, of opinions because because we, we think of it, I think it's often described as a Kremlin propaganda channel. So you think you'll get some kind of boring speeches by Putin or some disinformation about, about I don't know, Gazprom. There's very little of that. There is maybe 1% of praising Putin. 99% will be very vibrant, uh, uh, very vibrant Westerners uh, from a very wide political spectrum. So one minute you'll have Noam Chomsky, they love Noam Chomsky, talking about how awful America is. The next second you'll have Pat Buchanan talking about how great America is and how only America and Russia now understand true nationalism and how terrible the current US administration is. Um, then you will have somebody from the financial sphere telling them how great it is that Russia uh, is part of the globalized economy that is only being ruined by the terrible EU with its terrible regulations. Then you'll have Jean-Marie, uh, then you have uh, the younger Le Pen uh, saying how great Russia is uh, and how terrible the EU is. So you'll have a kaleidoscope of speakers from the right, the left, nationalists, pro-religious, uh, anarchists, all, you know, who will hate each other uh, and who will have really no opinion about the Putin regime a lot of the time, but who all united in one thing, they hate the West uh, in its current form. Uh, and, and this was very, very confusing to me. I, I wanted to understand, but what does Russia today really stand for? It has this bizarre kaleidoscope of, uh, of, of voices on it. And so I went to find out. I, I, I set up a meeting with, with the managing editor of, of Russia Today. He's the guy who really makes things happen. They have a figurehead, Margarita Simonyan, who is um, a sort of a pretty face. But there's a real guy called uh, Alexei Nikolov, who's the real kind of a very experienced journalist, 30 years at TASS, old KGB. Everyone thinks KGB, uh, everyone thinks KGB allegedly. Guy, but you know, uh, a, a, a man with a wealth of experience in media, a guy who knows what he's doing. Um, and so I, I set up a meeting with him in Moscow, um, and I really wanted to know what, what does he believe in, what does Russia today stand for? And um, he sits in this beautiful big office, uh, dressed in English tweeds. Uh, you probably think you, you, he was English if, if, if you came in, there's a little, little goatee, uh, set of golf clubs in the corner. Um, I think, I think a, a, there was even a volume of Jerome K. Jerome in the corner as well. Uh, there's a, there a facade of, of, of the ideal Englishman and a Kalashnikov in the corner as well. It was <laughs> quite, quite unusual. Very charming, perfect English, um, always smiling, very, very urbane, very, very witty. And, and I just kept on coming back to this thing. So, so, I mean, what is your editorial philosophy? You have, you know, you have conspiracy theorists, you have Pat Buchanan, you have this bizarre kind of, you know, motley array of people. W what is your station about? And he was like, listen, Peter, we all know that there is no such thing as objective truth. You know, it, it doesn't exist. There is no such thing as objective reporting. You know, there's only subjective view viewpoints and, uh, you know, you know, you know, the CNN have an American one, you know, the BBC have a British one, we have a, a Russian one. And I was like, okay, this is an, an interesting intellectual argument. There is no such thing as objective truth. Uh, so what is the Russian one? And I kept on pushing him. So what is the Russian point of view? And he was like, Peter, take a banana. A banana for a football hooligan is an insult to a black player. A banana for a monkey is food. A banana for a comedy director is something that you slip up on. The same with journalism, the same with truth. You can use any fact and spin it in any way and use it in any way you want. And the Russian point of view is like a banana. It can always change. We can change it any way we like, depending on the situation. I thought this was a very kind of honest discussion and it was very revealing about the kind of a uh, sort of the philosophy behind the current Russian regime. It's this con constant sort of a uh, shape-shifting uh, to meet whatever the situation needs. Um, and this is what kind of informs uh, Russia's today editorial policy. When it needs to be, when it suits Russia, it will be a Buchananite. When it suits Russia, it will be a Chomskyite. When it suits Russia, it will be um, a sort of a Friedmanite, believing in sort of like open borders. When it suits Russia, it'll be a neoconservative. It really doesn't matter. All that matters is how the banana works in that particular moment. Um, and this was, this, you know, I, I, I think this has become sort of very, very clear uh, as we uh, engage with the Ukrainian situation. 
Um, so Russia has been, via Russia today, and, but also through via other mechanism, has been setting up alliances with groups that are utterly contradictory. Uh, if in the good old days of the Cold War, sort of the Russian point of view would be funneled in the West through trade unions, communist parties. Nowadays it's built up a sort of a contradictory constellation of alliances that it can plug into to create a sort of an echo chamber of Russian support coming from completely different angles. So when the crisis struck, when Ukraine struck, when all this time Russia today has really been you know, building up to Ukraine in many ways, now is the raison d'etre for its, for its existence. Firstly, it gives disinformation and it gives a little bit of Putin praising, but then far more important, it engages with uh, voices uh, from the, the right wing through to the left wing who are now supporting Putin over Ukraine. And this has been, they've been building this up for a very long time and they've created this, you know, uh, this, this sort of, uh, you know, this, this, this orchestra of support from people who you wouldn't ne necessarily connect together. And it doesn't just operate through Russia Today. So Russia Today is almost like a, a distraction. It's the big, loud piece of Kremlin propaganda that everybody's watching, uh, while actually a lot of the more subtle forms of uh, propaganda are happening through uh, a more diffuse and subtle system. So there are funded experts throughout Europe and the US. Uh, there are think tanks uh, that are spreading the Kremlin's message from all sorts of different angles. Uh, a lot of the time they appear in Western media, not just on Russia Today, in Western media and Western uh, publications with no, sort of, um, uh, with no sort of credit that they're actually being funded by the Kremlin. There's a guy called, just one example, John Lockland, uh, who's a British historian, uh, has a think tank in Paris, writes in The Spectator. The think tank was set up by people very close to the Kremlin, is funded by oligarchs friendly to the Kremlin. He writes in The Spectator about how terrible the Maidan was, how it was full of fascists, how we need to support Russia. There is nothing accrediting saying this guy is Kremlin affiliated. Um, Alexander Ra, maybe the most famous example, a uh, very famous German political scientist who works for a consultancy close to Gazprom. Everybody knows him in policy circles as Putin's lobbyist in Germany. But he appears in German television in Die Welt with absolutely no reference as to his connections. John Lockland is an idea ideologue. He hates the EU. He hates the EU. That's why he likes Putin. Maybe the money isn't so important. Alexander Ra is more financially tied to the Kremlin. People are seduced by completely different ways. But one doesn't immediately associate them with a Kremlin propaganda. But that's what they're doing. Um, also, I think it's very important to look at um, uh, the subtler forms uh, and stories that the Kremlin is spreading. So we hear a lot about misinformation and disinformation. Uh, and in a way, that's very easy to counter the disinformation. Journalists go, they see whether ban you know, fascists have taken over Kiev. They see fascists haven't taken over Kiev. They disprove the Russian propaganda. But there are other sort of memes and narratives that the Kremlin spreads, uh, um, which, are mu which have a lot more influence. Um, because they, they sort of, um, they hit on uh, sort of uh, narratives in the West which are already very popular. I'll just mention a couple to open the debate. I'd be fascinated to know which ones are popular in Hungary. But what's worked very well in uh, Britain uh, is this idea of uh, NATO guilt, uh, Western guilt. This is the West's fault that Russia has to now defend itself. It's a very popular narrative in the West. Um, it feeds on, you know, the, whatever, the unsuccessful wars in, uh, middle, in the Middle East. Uh, and there's a, there's a whole quorum of support, completely unfunded by the Kremlin, which kind of resonates with the Kremlin saying, wow, this is all our fault, we shouldn't have done this, we shouldn't have put NATO, pushed NATO forward, uh, it's all our fault, God, how awful we've been to Russia. So the Kremlin doesn't even need to pay, need to pay these people, it sort of just like, you know, pushes uh, a story to them which they regurgitate back very readily. Um, another very popular one is the seduction of big power. Uh, this, this is very, very popular in Britain among members of the uh, Foreign Office. So you have a lot of former ambassadors who, I think this is a disease that spreads in the Foreign Office, like to think of the world as Britain, as Yalta, basically. Britain, Russia, America will cut up the world and decide the world between each other. So you have people like Tony Brenton, who's former ambassador to, uh, to Russia, uh, Roderick Braithwaite. These are genuine intellectuals. They're I don't think they're puppets in any way, but they genuinely believe and support the Kremlin's position that Ukraine 
doesn't have a voice in this. Ukraine is a small country, Central European countries are small countries, they're not important. What matters is Yalta, a new Yalta, a new sort of uh, Russia, Britain, America, sitting down, sorting it out together. And the Kremlin loves to feed these guys. It goes, oh yes, of course, Britain is so important. Let us big guys sit down and decide all this. That this is an intellectual seduction that happens very, very easily. Um, I'll just do a last point uh, that, that, that's, um, uh, to show how well sort of the Kremlin can feed uh, into, in, into fora that you wouldn't really think are pro-Kremlin fora instinctively. So um, uh, there was a beautiful article in The Guardian recently uh, by one of their columnists, which um, was based on the idea that we value very much in um, Western journalism of equivalence. And it said, guys, we don't really know what's happening in Ukraine. There's one side and another side. And, and go, yes, there are some people who say that Ukraine is full of fascists, but there are other people who say it's not full of fascists. And he went through all these points going either or, we don't have, you know, we don't have to have a strong position. And as he did this, uh, the columnist just started regurgitating these bits of misinformation. So he said, there have, of course, been some attacks on Jews in Ukraine by the fascists who've come to power. This is rubbish. This has been a bit of piece of information, disinformation said, fed by Russia today and by Moscow. But there are people who refute this. So even in taking on uh, the sort of idea of equivalence that all truth must have some sort of value, bits of misinformation are sort of uh, put into the digestive tract of the media in the West. That's just a small point, just uh, almost an aside, to show how bits of misinformation do actually sort of seep in. So very quickly, how do we deal with this? Because I think what we're seeing is a very different use of propaganda and information than what we saw in the Cold War. If in the Cold War it was very linear, the Soviet Union was pro-communist, it supported left-wing groups in the West. Now, in the sort of post-ideological age, the Kremlin is very good at using different, um, uh, diff uh, absolutely different, um, uh, different uh, spokespeople uh, to get its points across. So I think at the very least what one needs is some sort of institutional um, way to respond to this. Uh, so whether it's Radio Free Europe, where, whether it's think tanks, uh, one needs a capacity that every time any sort of uh, expert who's actually covertly funded by the Kremlin says something, there's an immediate response saying, hold on, this guy is not who, not an innocent expert, he actually has a vested interest. Um, every time a story is put out uh, where, um, uh, where, where one of the Kremlin memes, or one of the Kremlin narratives is reinforced, there has to be a, a response. At the moment this is happening, but it's ad hoc. We have to understand the Kremlin is doing this in an institutionalized way, and the response has to be institutionalized. That's a kind of minimum that needs to be done. I mean, it's something the Israelis have been doing for decades in a way to kind of like hold back, and maybe th that's a model for uh, for, for, for some inspiration. But I'll actually act, I'll actually finish with a way not to respond. So the Kremlin, the Kremlin's ideology is based on a radical postmodern relativism. The latest story that it spread is that it is a neoconservative power. Anybody who's been to Russia or who knows Russia knows that it is one of the uh, least conservative countries in the world. It's a country that uh, three percent of people who say they're religious go to church. It's one of the most atheist countries in Europe. Uh, it's 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 um, you know a very illicit, very corrupt culture. Um, you know, uh, abortion is very high. This idea that Russia is a bastion of religious conservatism is um, all the way up there with Putin was a great democrat a few years ago. Um, so it's another great sort of facade that the Kremlin's put on, but it's often reinforced by well-meaning journalists in the West who don't really understand how Russia works. So you have a wave of journalists, and this sort of started after the Russian anti-gay laws, uh, saying, my God, Russia is so conservative, which, the, uh, which the, the Kremlin is like, oh, yes, we are. We want to be seen as very conservative. So the Kremlin almost provokes Western journalists into writing about it and reinforcing it, its message as that it's a, sort of a neoconservative, a religious conservative uh, power. Um, and I think we have to be very careful. I think Western journalists um, fail often to appreciate sort of the deep, deep, deep cynicism of uh, Kremlin elites and of people like Mr. Nikolov, who believes the Russian point of view is a banana. Um, I'll end there.
Peter, thank you very much. There's a great deal to think about there and to talk about. I'm, I'm, I want to return to some of the specific points you made, and in particular to that last point about what might be done in response. But, but for the moment, let me now move on to um, Elizabeth and ask uh, 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 you, Elizabeth, to um, address the question. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I was introduced for, as being mainly at the BBC. This is true, I, although I did have a shortish academic career as well in Russian affairs. And I worked there um, from 1969 through to 19, uh, sorry, 2004 with GAPS. So um, I had a long experience of the broadcasting through the Cold War. But the first experience that actually told me what broadcasting then was about was in August 1968. I was in Leningrad, as it was then, St. Petersburg, uh, as a postgraduate student on a British Council-funded scholarship, and we had the invasion of Czechoslovakia. Um, I'm sure many people here remember that day. It was a, it was a considerable shock after the heady months of Dubček and the Prague Spring, and there was a great deal of fear, of course, about what was happening. Uh, and in Russia, there was a, a dearth of information, understandably. Everything was controlled. It was all the fascist, revanchist Germans this time who were at fault for what was happening in, in Czechoslovakia. And it was absolutely essential for the Warsaw Pact to go in to save um, all these innocent people who were about to meet a dreadful fate. Um, the, the BBC was broadcasting in Russian at the time, but these the broadcasts were jammed. This, this is something which you may not know much about. It's a, it's a very simple procedure. You broadcast on the same frequency as a radio station a perfectly dreadful noise, usually a loud buzz or a sort of hammering noise, or it can be a whine. It doesn't matter what the noise is. As long as it's loud enough, it will, defin it will shut out completely what is being transmitted. So the Russian service was off. And I found myself um, being asked to translate the World Service in English, which was not jammed, for a large group of friends. I had, to, I had a rather inferior quality transistor radio, which I was sitting on the floor of a flat because reception was better there, um, spending much of the day translating what was going on as it was being reported through Western various media outlets which were being picked up by the World Service in English. So this was a very dramatic illustration. Um, the people who uh, had got information from me were also following what was being said in the Soviet media. We had long discussions about the contrasting views. And I have to say that most of them um, had no time for the Russian story, if I can call it a story, the Russian version of events. And I think this is something that is probably very different nowadays. Um, we can come back to that particular point. Um, but the BBC had undoubtedly served a useful function at that time and continued to do so in the face of all manner of accusations of propaganda, anti-Soviet propaganda. Actually, the BBC was very careful about what it broadcast. Um, it uh, was very strict about two sources for news stories. Uh, Pro feature programs that were made uh, for um, semi-entertainment or for on difficult questions were very carefully researched and worded so that um, they would stand up in, in any context, not just in broadcasting to Russia. Um, this was not always uh, very easy for some of the staff to adhere to because uh, our Russian staff um, were working for the BBC because they wanted to improve things in Russia and they thought that uh, if you were a bit tougher on the Russians, maybe you could make things better. Anyway, um, be that as it may, uh, the policy was, was very clear. It was the same as the editorial policy of the domestic BBC, uh, which is that you don't take sides. And maybe the, a lifetime of having the BBC is partly to explain for this um, um, problem of equivalence that we still get in our media in writing about Russia. And it's perhaps something that we need to discuss more openly in the British media head on so that people can think more clearly about it. But at the time, it, it brought great authority, I believe, to BBC's broadcasts, and it certainly didn't alienate audiences. 
Um, there was lots of evidence, especially, of course, after the Soviet Union collapsed, that people had listened and had, had valued what they heard from the BBC. They didn't necessarily believe it all, um, didn't necessarily care even sometimes, but, uh, but they, they did believe that they were getting as truthful and honest an account as was possible in the circumstances. Uh, and it is one of the sadnesses that someone like Nikolov can be quite so cynical about truth. Um, I think that would come as quite a shock to many of our regular listeners um, from the past. Um, the next occasion, which I suppose one could say illustrates the power of broadcasting, was during the putsch that failed against Gorbachev when um, the people were listening to Western stations in the street. I mean, you didn't have to go and hide in your apartment then. People were walking around in the big demonstrations with, with radios clamped to their ears, listening for the latest news. And I have to say that Radio Liberty did the, the greatest service, I think, then, because it also had on its airwaves uh, Echo Moskvi, the one of the uh, important independent radio stations. and. Um, also, they broadcast 24 hours a day. The BBC went on to 24 hours a day broadcasting, but it had fewer reporters and slightly less material, so. Uh, but we did our bit as well. And um, I think we were a very important part of keeping people's um, spirits up, if you like, um, by reporting where other things were happening that were, in, were against the putschists, against the special committee that put itself in power. And as we know, of course, the attempted putsch collapsed after four days. Uh, we, this was then followed by the um, un difficult few months when Gorbachev was still in power and then the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union. And audiences to foreign broadcasters absolutely soared for a few years around those events. Um, and. Uh, it was one of the more encouraging things was that people really were listening in their millions. But of course, as time went on, the Russians themselves started getting uh, their act together. They started opening up stations. And we had um, delivery problems broadcasting into Russia, uh, which also affected our listenership. In the, in the old days of the Cold War, everybody used shortwave. And Russia used shortwave, or the Soviet Union, I should say more exactly. The Soviet Union used shortwave to broadcast to its own people because it was so vast. And shortwaves are very good for transmitting over long distances. Uh, so it meant that for Western broadcasters, this was the ideal vehicle for broadcasting into the country. But uh, in the, during the 90s, we had the introduction of uh, Western FM uh, into um, the, uh, the post-Soviet space. Uh, medium wave was in, in everybody's car and very few people really were keen on listening to, so, to short wave. And this is a, an important issue, I think, that when we come to what can be done is actually the issue of delivery, never mind the message, the delivery has to be there as well. Because with uh, Putin coming to power, so we've had roughly 10 years, shall we say, of uh, free media or relatively free media in inside Russia. But when, when Putin came to power, uh, it became much gradually, quite subtly in fact, uh, there was an, every year there would be amendments to the media law. And these amendments were designed to exclude for foreign broadcast material, to exclude foreign broadcasters, to make it more difficult to have partnerships with local stations, which had been quite common, in fact, in the 90s. We, the BBC had lots, and I think Radio Liberty had even more. They made it impossible for uh, foreign stations to hire broadcasting facilities inside the country. All these things were a gradual process through the 2000s of shutting out the Western broadcasters. And, and of course, um, this meant that audiences collapsed as well. So we have this problem that uh, we hadn't, uh, we, we um, had reached a point when there needed to be a new start. Now, looking back over those years of the Cold War and immediately after, um, what assessment can we make um, our, uh, of, of this work and of this money that was spent? And it seemed to me that um, it, 
It was very, very important in those days because it helped to set an agenda. It named the issues that needed to be resolved. It presented a different view of the world from the one that was in the Soviet media. And at the same time, it was not only attempting to be truthful, it would admit when things went wrong, and it was generally reliable. It was also relatively friendly. And a number of people I've spoken to have said that one of the things they liked was this friendly voice from outside that was telling them about things they had no hope of seeing, because of course people didn't travel very much in those days. So I think all of those things we brought to Russia, and we have to rethink how we can bring those things again in the future, because right now I don't think we are bringing them in very successfully. Uh, and this is a source of great concern and of great sadness, but mainly concern, actually. It was, um, I'm concerned because everybody thought, well, we used to have a media war and we won, and so we don't need to do anything anymore. Um, John alluded to the reduction in um, budgets and so on, and this is perfectly true. It was regarded as the peace dividend, and in the case of the BBC, the argument went, well, we stopped broadcasting to Eastern Europe because now they're in the EU, they don't need it. Um, then the next argument was, well, we uh, reduce broadcasting any further away than that. Um, Russia, Ukraine, Ukraine was stopped. Central Asia was reduced to a little Uzbek and a little Kazakh. Um, Azeri survived just. Um, but these were all cut back because it was so much more important to broadcast to the Middle East. And a lot of money was put into Farsi television, which uh, John knows about, um, and which I understand is very successful. I don't have an opinion. I don't know Farsi and I don't see the programs, but I know that a lot of work has gone into that. And they also went into Arabic television which I must say, as an outsider, I thought was less obviously a good idea. Um, I don't know how um, well all Arabic speakers understand each other for a start, because there's this huge range of uh, variations around the Middle East and North Africa. And there was Al Jazeera, which was already there, most of the people who work for Al Jazeera were trained by the BBC, and there, were, there they were already with a big audience. However, that's, that's perhaps not appropriate here. That's me nitpicking against the BBC. Um, it's, it's also because it, it means that what is left now uh, to reach people in Russia, and to take the case of Ukraine, in Ukraine, which used to have its own service, uh, is uh, an, an internet offer. This is the delivery means that we, that we are using today. And I think to a degree it works pretty well. Um, the issue really is how many people have access to broadband. Because without broadband you, you have very slow reception. You won't look at the pictures or uh, watch the film or listen to the audio that's on there because it takes too long to download. Um, there's quite a lot of written materials, so those pages should come up all right. But will people be bothered in the current climate? Is this what they want? We need a lot of work to establish, I think, what, what is the best way of reaching audiences now with a different view of the world from the one that they are receiving. Because that they are receiving a, an altogether unbelievably colored view of the world um, is actually quite shocking to me that that there seems to, it seems to be so successful. Um, certainly, uh, I, I won't repeat what Peter was saying about how um, the Russian authorities have devised um, the way they broadcast to to capture the various prejudices and. Uh, emotions and um, beliefs of their audience, but they've done it extremely well. And it's something that needs a huge effort to make sure that um, we don't do, you know, we do the right things to reach people and to help them to start thinking about what's going on themselves, for themselves. Um, Ukraine, I think it's worth mentioning, was particularly problematic for the Kremlin because uh, it has always feared some kind of infection of. Uh, of views from from there. It's very close, after all, to Russia. 
Um, it it um, was deeply distressed by the Orange Revolution. The fact that um, Yushchenko and uh, his one-time Prime Minister Yulia Tymoshenko fell out so openly and made such a mess of it um, was must have been a matter of great relief, I think, to the Russians. It didn't do much for the poor Ukrainians, of course. Uh, and then the demonstrations that uh, Yanukovych was unable to bring to an end uh, were really the last straw, I think. I'm sure Putin had actually been planning some sort of move and was waiting for an ideal opportunity. Um, because um, what, of course, he didn't want to come across to the Russian audience was that the so-called Euro Maidan, the demonstrations in Independence Square that were in tent cities for weeks and weeks through the winter, although initially it appeared to be about joining the EU, I mean, membership of the EU wasn't actually on the table for Ukraine and is not likely to be for a very long time, if ever. Uh, what it was about was an association agreement that would improve trading opportunities for Ukraine uh, and which the demonstrators believed and hoped would help to deal with the absolutely chronic corruption that infects really now most of Ukrainian life. They wanted someone, something, some external force that would help to deal with this corruption and the, the hope was that um, in implementing the EU rules on trade would, would help. And we have to remember that uh, Ukraine is next door to Poland. Many Ukrainians have visited Poland, and indeed the queues of, of Ukrainians crossing the Polish border were picked up by Russian media uh, when they had ran that story about, was it 600,000 refugees from Ukraine because they were so frightened? Um, the pictures that they produced in support of this turned out to be a peaceful queue of cars waiting to go through the Polish border at the weekend. And it looks like that every weekend. So this, um, but it tells you that lots and lots of Ukrainians do travel and had seen, and they have been very struck by what Poland has achieved over the years. Uh, whereas Poland before the collapse of the Soviet Union had a much lower standard of living and GDP than Ukraine, Poland now is racing ahead, Ukraine is far behind. This is not a nice thing for the Ukrainians to realize uh, has happened to them and it uh, contributes to their dissatisfaction with their political class. Um, so I think the only other point I would like to make is, is uh, about our ambassadors and so on that uh, Peter again mentioned about this view that it's up to the great powers to sort this out, Britain of course being included as a great power, when in fact it's, it should be up to the Ukrainians. And I think perhaps, I hope, and I'd be interested to hear other people's views on this, that the strength of the feeling against joining Russia, which is well attested, and somebody will be picking up the, uh, the information, even if they don't broadcast it. Um, even in eastern Ukraine, it's not, at, it, it's not more than 30% would, would vote in a free vote to go to join Russia, not more than, and probably a lot less. And 70% have said they definitely wish to stay in Ukraine. Uh, this is not, um, it's not easy to make that look like a, a rush of the entire population as Putin managed to engineer in, in Crimea. So that's something else that's left. And I'll be happy to come back in on what should be done in the future. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you very much indeed. Uh, again, a lot of points there which I would like to, to raise, but I think that's going to wait a moment until Ian has spoken. Ian. I thought I had 20 minutes, and you've now reduced it to one moment. Oh, I think 20 moments each lasting a minute. <laughs> Thank you. Have yes. you gone over? I think it did. One, one other little uh, quibble with the organisers, uh, if I may. Um, when I was an academic, uh, we were always discouraged from putting exam questions in a form that required only yes or no as an answer. So, uh, are we losing the information war? Yes. <laughs> Does it matter? Yes. <laughs> and that's the moment. <laughs> but uh, if you do it academic style and say, to what extent are we losing the information war? Then 
we've got permission to bat it around a bit, which is what I'd like to do. Um, basically, I, I think I'm a nice chap, but um, uh, there's evidence to the contrary, which I'm sure my wife will dismiss. But um, in the Cold War, of course, opinions among opinion farmers uh, differed quite a lot. And in some ways, they were predictable. If you read left-wing newspapers, then they were critical of people who took a tough line on uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, if you read the conservative uh, press, then they're much more likely to say, this is the guy we want to write for us. And uh, the left-wing press is simply wrong. So there was quite a lot of this uh, in uh, my career where I have started just as someone interested in Russia and Russia's impact. And there were, of course, all sorts of exciting things happening. Uh, I was just old enough to pay attention to 1956, Suez, and of course, uh, Budapest. And uh, I have to say, I was not old enough to have anything to do with Radio Free Europe at that time, so uh, the problems that there were about uh, the broadcasts then, which we still discuss, um, uh, were certainly not part of my doing. But there were areas in which the dispute about information on the Cold War, on the Soviet Union, uh, became quite bitter. And uh, I remember some cases, like, for instance, Soviet Analyst, which I edited for a while with uh, Robert Conquest, the author of The Great Terror, um, where we were criticised for uh, our coverage of some event, and we could show that we had quoted all our sources, including the Soviet press and what they were saying on this particular issue. And we were very careful about the sources, and that's something that uh, one does now with any discussion of information too. Um, the uh, period in which uh, I wrote Leaders for the Times and uh, features on the Soviet Union for the Times in London uh, were probably where I uh, was most in the firing line and uh, a lot of people uh, would compl complain about the line that the Times took but uh, when the ambassador, the Soviet ambassador, invited the editor, the great Charles uh, <coughs> 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 Sorry, the great Charles Douglas Hume uh, and uh, the associate editor and myself, um, we were asked to try and moderate the strength that we denounced Soviet policies in some case. And I said, well, if you can find any inaccuracies, please tell us. And uh, we will, of course, uh, uh, publish any letter that you would send us uh, showing that we have uh, moderated our opinion. And uh, I was told, well, it's not so much that uh, there are any errors there, it's just that you attack us in a way that even the Daily Telegraph doesn't do. <laughs> and uh, so we left that one as uh, uh, to be continued. Uh, in fact, Charlie uh, asked me to do a leader for the next day's paper uh, about megaphone diplomacy, uh, pointing out uh, what the Soviet side was doing. Um, we, in various publications, uh, fought against KGB disinformation. There's been a mention of uh, this earlier. Um, there were very flagrant examples. I remember one in particular which uh, uh, said that AIDS, that terrible disease, uh, was deliberately developed by the American military. And of course this sounded nonsense to me when I heard that uh, it was picked up by a British newspaper, even a conservative one, the Sunday Express. And sure enough, uh, when one read the piece, which covered the whole front page, one saw that the source for this were various publications, most of them third world, but if you had managed to get hold of those 
third world sources, you then discovered that they all quoted the same source, who was a biologist working in Humboldt University in East Berlin. And he had simply thought it up and thought that probably such a horrible thing must have been invented artificially and the people who must have done it would be the American military. So there were sites like this where one was constantly battling uh, the information war. Um, my time in uh, Radio Liberty was, of course, uh, uh, very hectic. That was 88 through to 93, so the whole period of the collapse in uh, Eastern Europe of communism and uh, uh, the collapse of uh, communism in Russia itself. Uh, this was a, a time that we didn't get very much sleep, but everybody was so interested in what was happening that uh, we didn't grudge losing our sleep over it. It was a time which you must remember better than us even. Uh, very interesting time. Uh, I remember colleagues like uh, Sasha Ra, for instance, who uh, at that time was researching for Radio Liberty. And I remember one occasion, he was a very good researcher, and uh, he produced a regular 100 leading politicians in the Soviet Union, which was uh, very widely used by journalism uh, in the West, and it turned out in uh, the East too. Uh, I suggested that he sent uh, these potted biographies to the uh, biography, uh, for his comments, um, and uh, we didn't expect very much to come back from Russia, but in fact, Fairmount did. This was in the Gorbachev period, including the head of the KGB, who <laughs> said, uh, thank you, uh, we are delighted to see that Glasnost has even reached Radio Liberty. So at this time, it was nil-nil, I think, uh, but uh, uh, we felt that when communism went, we had played a role in it and uh, a good thing too. Uh, if one looks at the present period, uh, I think you can find quite a few examples where I would moderate this attitude that uh, the information war has been lost. Um, up to a point, I think, again, is perhaps how I, I would put it. Um, I had seven points which uh, I wanted to illustrate this with and I'll throw in some of the material in it. Uh, point two, does it matter? Certainly, I thought there was uh, much too hasty an approach to reap the peace dividend. This is what all of us who depended on government <coughs> money uh, thought about uh, the end of the Cold War, that it would be a bad time for instance for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, if Congress turned round and said, good, we've got rid of those so-and-sos in the Kremlin, so uh, let's get the budget, then 200 million a year, uh, let's get this budget back and spend it in something else. And a lot of people, including at least half a dozen presidents of the new countries, uh, argued that it was much too soon to uh, close down the radios and uh, please keep them going as a special favour to our country. And uh, there was a, a moderated decision taken in Washington at that time and uh, the cuts were severe, ferocious even, but uh, not final. Um, My argument over this period was always that uh, if you looked at NATO, we had had NATO around for a long time, by the time the Soviet Union collapsed, and one could easily argue that NATO had done its job. It was there, it cost far more than radios and other such things, but it served its purpose very well. And Nobody grudged it, nobody suggested that NATO should go at the end of uh, the Cold War. And in fact, the contrary, uh, NATO expanded and is expanding. 
And this strikes me as really how it should be. Um, it's a deterrent, and it's constant defence. Can't one argue something similar about broadcasting, that uh, when a crisis comes up, you should have the tools in place to be able to put over the arguments of uh, the Western leaders, but also the arguments of uh, Western thinkers, specialists, experts in international affairs and so on. Uh, very important to get over to people like Russians who now uh, believe that uh, it's a good thing to have brought Crimea back into Russia, as they put it. Um, and uh, there are so many of those arguments that one wants to have that depend on information going through, information going back and forward. And at the moment, that's so difficult because of the cuts that uh, the radios have suffered recently. Um, the question is, why should we be out without these uh, tools? When, if you look at what's happening now, since Yeltsin, Yeltsin, there was still hope, it seemed to me, and to a lot of other uh, Russia watchers. Um, since then, there's been a gradual slip back. And if you look at what's happening in Russia today, it is really quite fierce. It's not just the corruption, the land grabbing, a new word that's really come into its own. Um, what one sees too is that uh, there are wars that are very difficult to justify, Chechen war, the war over South Ossetia, Abkhazia, the way that Russia has handled it. These are all things that ought to be discussed openly and aren't in the Russian media at the moment. Uh, there are a lot of bad guys around in that area. Uh, if you think of the, the crime of murder alone, which most of us see as one of the worst crimes, uh, I can mention people who uh, were close either because we had met them or because uh, of uh, the writing and the broadcasting. Yuri Shekhochikhin, we knew since the the coup when Elizabeth and I were both in Moscow for the coup. Um, deputy of uh, Novaya Gazeta, and at that time uh, of the coup, uh, a member of the Duma. And uh, he died in much the same miserable way as another man, Alexander Litvinenko, the KGB colonel, uh, new form of murder. Uh, others, politician Galina Starovoitova, journalist Anna Politkovskaya. These are people that died in a nasty way and their murderers haven't been found yet. And there doesn't seem to be a great deal of attention being put into finding the murderers. Uh, so the loss of the information war, if it is indeed true, is a great tragedy, it seems. Uh, but. Looking hard at the situation, I think there are some ways where you can say a complete loss uh, can be moderated. In general, I would argue that democracies in conflicts tend to lose every battle but the last one. You don't want to carry the war on any longer than you need to, but you have to win. And democracies are actually very strong once the whole population gets behind the government and uh, does what's necessary. And uh, <clears throat> I think uh, already one can see signs of hope, dare one say. Uh, talking of the RT earlier, uh, I was uh, always tending to compare uh, RT and the way it covered some event with something of free media, such as one can still see in Kiev. And uh, I was looking not so long ago, a week or two ago, uh, at a program of uh, uh, Schuster Live. I don't know if any of you have seen this, but uh, Savik Schuster was uh, someone who was one of our best scooping journalists uh, in my period with the radios, and then went to Moscow moved to NTV, the television company, uh, fell out with them when it came under government control. 
and moved to Kiev. And his program uh, has live discussion. And it definitely is live, and you can tell it's live. There's no way you can cut what people have said or anything of that type. It bubbles over with real arguments with people from different points of view. And really lively TV in a way that I haven't seen on RT. Uh, there are lots of little examples that have cropped up recently which show that uh, the information war still goes. Uh, I like the, the, the one on the Colorado Beetle, uh, which has been going round because of the St. George <coughs> ribbon, which you've probably seen in film of uh, Ukraine. And uh, people who were tired of seeing this ribbon uh, said that it should be exterminated in much the same way as the Colorado Beetle, which attacks potatoes and is a great problem in that part of the world. And uh, uh, this was played over in different ways. Uh, there's Sergei Lavrov, the uh, foreign minister, who was accused of having a U-turn on invading eastern Ukraine. And uh, it is quite clear that he got new instructions from Putin, because having over two weeks said there will never be an invasion of Ukraine uh, by Russia. He turned round and said, well, we have to defend Russians, and if they're attacked, then of course Russia will not be found wanting. Uh, that was pointed out in uh, the free media in a way that uh, hasn't been, I don't think, on uh, RT. Uh, there are signs of um, the United States coming in in a way that reminded me of IRD. You remember IRD, uh, John? Uh, information Research Department of the British Foreign Office was seen as not quite the right thing to uh, publish papers for journalists that uh, uh, were attacking the Soviet Union. They didn't really attack the Soviet Union, they just <coughs> quoted the Soviet press, for instance, as to what was actually being said. And journalists could use the material if they wanted to or didn't want to, but it was properly researched little articles which would give a non-expert some kind of background that would allow them to write editorials and newspapers and that <coughs> kind of thing. Um, at a time when it was discovered that uh, this uh, information research department e existed, um, that was 77 I think, uh, The Guardian, uh, one of the, the papers that I have uh, had problems with every now and again, although in many ways it's a good newspaper, uh, did a very large piece exposing this department, uh, while admitting that actually it did quite a good job in some ways. Well, what one sees now is that uh, there have been at least two uh, attempts by the Americans uh, to produce ten question and answers, uh, what Putin has said and what reality is and this complete contrast, in other words, accusing Putin, President Putin, of lying. Uh, but the evidence that's put up is pretty strong. And uh, likewise, the quote is, say, carefully sourced, so nobody could uh, argue that Putin hadn't actually come out with this direct lie. So this kind of information is very important, I think, and is already underway in the information uh, war. Um, uh, there was a, a piece that they uh, showed on Russian television proving that there were concentration camps being built in uh, Ukraine to put all those free Russians who were uh, uh, defending their rights by storming buildings, etc., etc. The reality was pointed out with film by quite a few of the channels. Um, this was actually a construction work that started under Yanukovych and uh, the idea was to build accommodation for refugees and those who wanted to squeeze themselves into the EU and uh, Ukraine had to of course house them and they were expanding the facilities for doing this and it had nothing to do with the freedom fighters of the 
uh, Russian mafia. Um, another point which struck me as somewhat optimistic was that uh, uh, we have the support that we never had in the old Cold War of uh, the socialist countries as well then, uh, Hungary and the others, um, who uh, it seems to me are very much concerned about uh, uh, losing the advantages that have come in the last decades um, and uh, don't want to see yourself uh, reading only the communist press every morning. Uh, there are some people who again participated in the old Cold War. I remember, for instance, Radik Sigorsky contributing to Soviet analysts on uh, uh, Afghanistan. He's a very young journalist and uh, now the Polish foreign minister, of course. Uh, Thomas Ulvus, uh, president of Estonia, was head of the um, uh, Radio Free Europe Estonian service did very good service at that time. How are we doing for time? Uh, Wrap it up. Keep going. Uh, it strikes me that the new technology helps a lot. Uh, emails, computer links, uh, mobile links. When I think of how it took a fortnight for a letter to go to Moscow and a fortnight for it to come back uh, with the lid clearly opened and uh, glue stuck on it to close it after the sensor had read it, etc. Now you text back and forward instantly. That helps the information flow a great deal. It's uh, something that we didn't have in those days. Uh, at that time the KGB could used to uh, look after all the fax machines and all the photocopying machines. There were special rooms that were under lock and key. Um, and uh, now, of course, uh, uh, that would be impossible uh, with the new technology that we have. Uh, even in Russia, there's a certain amount of support. Uh, I think Elizabeth mentioned this at the polls in East Ukraine. Uh, it struck me that the younger generation, when you see the demonstrations that we've had in the streets, are actually very keen to be involved with the West. And uh, this is something that's uh, uh, not seen by them. Um, intelligentsia, writers, scientists, it's another area of support, uh, speaking out in defense of human rights, free flow of people and information. Uh, this is the kind of thing you could quote Sakharov on, of course, unfortunately no longer with us. But uh, I saw a literary specialist in the uh, Daily Telegraph recently quoting Anton Chekhov uh, to support uh, the Western view of what was happening in Crimea. Um, in a letter to a friend, uh, Alexei Suvorin, in November 1888, Chekhov wrote, the Tartars were swindled out of the land, yet no one spares a thought for the welfare. Well, if you look at the Crimean Tartars today and what they're saying, it's very much the same and good for them to know that they were supported by such an outstanding intellectual as uh, Chekhov. Um, others that you could mention in that line would be Andrei Kurkov and his pieces in Time magazine. Uh, one could talk too about Boris Akunin, a very popular writer who has made his views very clear. So basically I think there are optimistic moments around if one looks hard enough for them. And uh, as we say, there is uh, that phrase, the truth will out, and one hopes that it will prevail. Thank you. <laughs>